Hello everyone and thank you today for joining us for a learning and growing webinar active learning for sensation perception. My name our presenter today is Timothy Barnes of Central Carolina Community College. My name is Sidra and I'll be your moderator today for Hawks Learning. We will have a live Q&A session after the presentation, so please enter any questions you have into the Q&A module or in the chat feature as we go and we'll be sure to answer them. I'll now hand it over to our presenter. All right, hello everyone. Um, this gives me a good opportunity to talk to you about a, a dynamic activity that I run in my classrooms called Sensation Stations. Um, in teaching a student-centered approach to teaching, it requires knowing the students' unique needs and presenting academic topics. So a general psychology course is often the first um, experience that my students have in coming into college. So they come into the classroom kind of as passive learners, and I have to catch their attention right away. So the challenge is nudging them to engage in the material. And this is one activity that allows them to do that. In every module that I teach during the uh, general psychology series, uh, it contains lecture, visual, uh, experiments, assessments, activities, and a review quiz. So I believe that my style of teaching is repeat, repeat, repeat. They're hearing it for the first time. They need to hear it many different ways. They also have a workbook that I've created that goes along with all of this content. So as we go through the modules, they write down information. And oftentimes they don't remember it until they hear it again the next time or you know, over and over. So um, that kind of leads me to this presentation called Sensation Stations. It's a dynamic learning activity that uh, uh, I'm teaching the you know, sensations uh, people experience. So people take their five senses for granted and they don't think about what's happening when they're sensing the environment. So this activity isolates sensations to allow students to learn something about what happens, such as transduction, um, action potential, what part of the brain is being activated. So sensation stations are, are placed throughout the, the room and students can go to any one of those activities at one time. Now I've created a video here with some student actors that um, agreed to allow me to videotape them and I'll go through each one of them. So we're gonna show right. And we're going to share the screen. There we go. Share screen. Okay. This one here. All right. So we're ready to go on this one. Let me back this up a little bit. This is the feel and tail. So the student has a box that they put their hand in. So they can't see the objects in the box. But the objects in the box need to be something that is... Uh, pretty common. And uh, the questions on the worksheet is what part of the brain is being activated when you look at some of these objects? Also questions are like, what experience do you have when you feel an object? So what we get back from the students is, well, I felt a seashell and it, it reminded me of the beach. So talking to them about how we visualize things from pictures that we see in our, in our brain. This next one, um, and you notice that she has a difficult time opening the container. Um, that's something that I learned that you need to uh, be careful about what kind of containers that you use because uh, either open them up for them or, or um, just use something that's easy to open. Now, what she's smelling here is she's smelling perfume. And, uh, and then there is uh, a garlic powder and there would be cinnamon. So these are, again, very common experiences. And, uh, and so we talk about, at this point, we talk about feature detectors. And feature detectors are neurons in the brain that isolate sensation 
um, and to be able to detect certain kinds of smells or sights or sounds in the environment. We talk about it in lecture. Um, they often forget, but I have them go back to their workbook and see what they wrote down in terms of feature detectors. Object first. This is the mystery object. Now I do want to have some uh, kind of an object in the room that stu most students wouldn't recognize. Some students do recognize this as a guitar tuner, but most students don't know a, that it's a guitar tuner because they've never seen it before. And so the questions on the sheet is, uh, what is this? And so make your best guess and write down what you think it might be. So what they're looking at, and you notice this student is... Um, she doesn't know what it is, so she's looking at it, trying to figure out, looking at the characteristics of the object, and she's looking at it again. It could be a, a radio. It could be something that hooks to a computer. But what she's recognizing is something that she has uh, she's seen before, even though she doesn't know what this is. And then the question is, is this top-down or bottom-up processing? Now, again, students will forget what bottom-up, top-down processing is. And in the summary, we talk about, um, you know, that bottom-up processing is when you identify the characteristics of the object and they look like something maybe that you have seen before. And so you're trying to make your best guess of what it is. Top-down, of course, is that it's already in your memory and you're able to identify the object for what it is. Now, one thing about the, uh, the the brain, so question that I ask on the worksheet is um, what part of the brain is activated when we're trying to figure out what it is? Now, what I do for the students is I, is I go, what is this? And I'm touching the temporal lobe of my brain. And that is what's activated, the area of the brain is activated when we are trying to figure out what it is. And... Um, and one little side note here, girls are better at what it is than guys are. Guys are better at where it is. This is Gestalt. We uh, talk about Gestalt in this uh, module. And uh, I talk about some of the Gestalt principles like continuity and proximity. And this one uh, principle is called closure. So I throw them off a little bit because I wanna talk about how we get thrown off in the environment, but Gestalt is looking at it from a whole, from the whole. Uh, Gestalt psychologists believe that we're born with this and that this is the way we view the environment, not from the pieces, but from the whole. But I throw them off because I ask the questions, do these objects, on the card have any meaning to you? Uh, you see arrows pointing up, pointing down. You see objects that look like buildings. But in this case, this student understands Gestalt or the Gestalt principle of closure. And so he's looking at the card. He comes up and he covers the white so that he can see what the card actually is. And when you look at the card closely from that perspective and your brain does the, the closure, what you see on the card is you see the word, uh, if I can get it back here, you see the word win. I did that pretty quickly. There you go. Yeah, you can detect the word win in the card. This next um, part or station is what is called opponent processing theory. Now she's staring at a 
at a gold, green, and black flag. There's a dot in the middle. She's looking at it for about 30 seconds, and then she looks at the whiteboard, and it changes to a red, white, and blue flag. In the summary, we talk about what is actually happening. They give their best guess to what is happening with the flag, but what uh, you know, what we, what I tell them is that the cones in the eye, where we have color, are lined up with the bipolar cells with different colors: black and white, gold and blue, green and red. And that when you look away, the after image shows you the strongest colors that come out of that uh, that image. This uh, card is one of the the last. Uh, objects that I give them, as stations that I give them. And when everyone's done with the stations, then I come back and put a card face down on their desk. So then at the same time, I have them pick up the card and to read the card and then put it back down. And then I ask them again to pick it up and count the number of Fs in the card. Well, and then put it back down and write that number at the bottom of the sheet. And what students will come up with is two Fs, uh, four Fs, five Fs, six Fs. Well, everyone has the same card, but lots of people get different answers with how many Fs are on the card. It gives me an opportunity to talk to them in the summary about what actually is occurring because we sense the environment through what we call heuristic. We've watched, we look at it very quickly, pass by it. And, uh, and if we took the time to look at the environment from a, an algorithm, it just take too much time. So what happens is we, is we sense the environment very quickly and our brain fills in the gaps. That's why a witness in court makes a very poor evidence. Finally, what I have here is, is pretty interesting. I, uh, I mailed away to get a, uh, a fake hand. <laughs> and uh, you notice that I'm stroking her right hand, real hand, and then the fake hand. And if you're going to do this, you, you should stroke it at the same time and have her stare at the fake hand. And many students will begin to get a sensation in the fake hand. And uh, you notice this student's going to act like she has the, the, uh, the experience of a sensation. But it's it's kind of a weird thing, and we get to talk about phantom phantom sensations, phantom pains uh, from this experiment. There she goes. She acted. Out. All right. So uh, that brings us to the the end of uh, the video, and this is what the worksheet looks like. It's just a real simple worksheet, but it's questions on it. And any student that says I don't know. Uh, writes, I don't know, then um, they can't have the have the points for it until they complete it, until they do a little bit of research. So I'll hand it back to them and say, um, finish the, you know, finish it uh, because that's, you're not done yet. All right. So um, at this point, I want to stop sharing and come back with any questions that you might have. You can use any um, of the options. You can use the Q&A feature. You can use the chat to drop your questions in. I'm not sure if I got the question. Um... It wasn't a question. I was letting them know that they can use the chat feature or the Q&A feature for their questions. Is there any question coming up over there? Over here, uh, bottom right corner. 
I'm not finding the, yeah, if you have any question, just type it in and I can read it because this video or this audio is not good for me. Okay. There's, there's no questions. It doesn't look like there are any questions. Uh, do you have any closing remarks for us? Do you have any closing remarks for them? Anything you want to say to conclude it? Oh, there's a question. Do you oh, use this in large classes? Right here? Yeah, they're asking that. Oh. Uh, uh, let me see the question, application in the math class. That's interesting. Um, any kind of a dynamic activity it requires that the students are getting up and doing things. And so in my, you know, as far as a math class, I'm not sure. Uh, there's a lot of different math activities that you can do. You can use uh, dynamic activities for, which I'm sure that you already know. Um, in this, uh, you know, we, throughout the course, there's all kinds of dynamic, get up from your seat and do this activity. Um, sensation stations is just one. I just wrote a, an emotion motivation uh, sensation station, or it's kind of like sensation stations that uh, follows some of the uh, information that we have for emotion motivation. As far as large classes, uh, I've, I've run this with, uh, we usually have about 25 students in the classroom. If you have a, a really large class, you might uh, want to do it in a lab. And, um, you know, my desire is to someday have a lab that we that I can run students through in a smaller group. But yes, it works pretty well with, um, you know, with them. It takes about for a, a class of about 25 students, it will take about uh, 50 minutes to go from the beginning to the summary. Thank you. Would you be able to use the these techniques in a large class? You can use them in a large class. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It, it depends on when you talk about large class. I've been in classes of 300 and <laughs> Uh, it wouldn't work well in that classroom, but that classroom had a lab. And um, so the lab was broken down into about 25 students. And so I would, I would recommend that, depending on the size of your classroom, um, if you had a large classroom, you could actually run two sets of the sensation station. Thank you. Does this activity require a lecture? Does it require a lecture? Uh, the, the lecture, as I said before, um, much of what we talk about in sensation goes back to biopsychology. And so uh, the lecture of biopsychology, uh, they write down this information in their workbook. Then when, it, when we get to sensations, uh, perception, then what happens is that they uh, will refer back to, you know, what was in the lecture. Now, as far as sensations, I begin with a lecture. So a lot of the information that they discover in the sensation stations has already been talked about. But like I said before, students will, you know, a, a lot of times they'll come into the classroom as passive learners and you have to really kind of catch their attention and in some cases, force them to, uh, to do some things with the information. Because you know, if you, if you are a lecturer, as I am, that uh, students will have a tendency to um, tune out. Unless, and as soon as I get, I, I created the workbooks for my lectures, then they're a little more engaged where they're writing down information as I'm presenting it to them. Then when you go to the learning activity, you can come back to, um, you know, you can come back to it and uh, to the workbook and they can see what they wrote down. And it's just sort of a repeat of that, 
information. So yes, it's combined with lecture. It has to be, you have to give them the information. So this is of course, student centered approach, but it's, it's uh, teacher led. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we have a participant that teaches in multiple classrooms. How much time does it take to set up? The person uses multiple classrooms. So how much time does it take to set up? How much time does it take in, in a classroom? Mm -hmm. um, like I said, from beginning to end, I, I usually have 50 minute classes. And um, from the beginning to the end of the class, it takes about that period of time. I, I use up that 50 minutes. Um, you can adjust your schedule as you go along, but um, it, you know, it usually takes about that amount of time. If students, the problem I have um, a lot of times, in fact, every time, is that um, students didn't show up for that particular class. And so they're not getting the points. So they come to me and they say, you know, how am I going to get the points? And just to kind of keep things organized, I set up sensation stations for those students that missed it on a certain day at the end of the semester. If they come in, they can they can run through sensation stations, they can complete the, the worksheets and I'll give them a grade. If they don't show up, it's too bad. They get a zero, you know, they don't get grade for it, a grade for that uh, uh, particular um, learning object or learning lesson. <laughs> Thank you so much. Do you have any conclusionary or closing remarks? Any closing remarks? Closing remarks. Good. Do you have any closing remarks? Anything you want to say at the end? Okay. All right. I don't have any uh, other things to say. Well, great. Thank you so much. Um, and that looks like all the time that we have. We will be emailing you a link to the to view the recording of this webinar once it becomes available. If you or any of your fellow instructors are interested in presenting for our learning and growing webinar series, please submit your proposals to the learning and growing website, which I'm going to go ahead and link in the chat right now for easy access. Okay. These free webinars are brought to you by Hawks Learning, an innovative educational courseware company. To learn more about our mastery based course materials and how Hawks can enhance learning outcomes for you and your students, please visit hawkslearning.com. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.